What's going on, all you Minties? This is the Uncanny Omar from Near Mint Condition, the home of Collected Editions. And join me today for an advanced look at the X-Men Fall of the Mutants Omnibus from Marvel Comics. Let's get started. And welcome back, everybody. Before getting started, a huge thank you to David Gabriel and the fine folks at Marvel for sending us an advanced copy of this omnibus. This omnibus is due out in the direct market and the book market on May 17th or 18th, depending on where you get your books. So here we have it. Finally, the book that you all voted for to make into an omnibus uh, in our 20, was it 2020 poll. Yeah, I guess it must have been a 2020 poll. Before that, we did uh, Inferno. And then the Inferno Prologue, and Mutant Massacre, and now we have Fall of the Mutants. It's been kind of crazy how, you know, Marvel has been listening to the fans, and this is the books that you all voted for. I like to sneak in one oversized hardcover in there. So yes, this originally came out in oversized hardcover format, and of course before that in trade paperback, and before that it was originally in single issues. I think the very first trade paperback of this I had was in 2002. Uh, and then the oversized hardcover came out in 2011. Uh, but we are going to be talking about that. We're going to be looking at the differences there. Here it is next to the original oversized hardcover. Uh, the contents are the same, but like I said, we're going to be looking at the differences here in a little bit. The biggest difference I'm sure you could tell right now is the cover. For all you purists, they've gone back to the original coloring of Alan Davis's house ad here. Uh, this is the omnibus, and I know people are divided. Some people like the modern uh, modernization of the colors. Some people are purists and are like, no, I have the colors have to be the way that I remember them being. I get it. I get both sides of the argument. But rest assured, it does have the original colors. Uh, the spine, this, by the way, being the standard edition version. We'll talk about uh, the direct market here in a little bit. Uh, the spine is a little bit different this time around. It's X-Men with the Fall of the Mutants logo instead of just Fall of the Mutants. Um, and then, of course, the same Mark Silvestri picture, again, this being the direct market, I'm sorry, standard edition. Uh, one thing you're going to notice is how much thicker this was. Again, 2011, 2021 print. And then the back of the book. Now, let's see, three X-Men teams, different font, same con exactly the same content. So if you have this and you don't care about the word omnibus then there's no need to upgrade to this or but it's been out of print for so many years i think most of you probably will pick this up uh the biggest sin here though is that this has gone up in price this was 99 dollars 99 this is a flat even hundred dollars retail price so it went up one penny how dare they but even the image is the same actually you get more of an image here of mark silvestri's cover to i assume this is what 227 if i'm not mistaken um, but there is a direct market uh, version of this. We're going to bring it back to this uh, when it, we do a comparison of the artwork, the internal stuff. There on the left-hand side, this is your direct market cover. It features the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse, all the teams around them. And this is from a Marvel Age cover. Uh, Brett Blevins did that. Uh, the spine is, of course, different because Marvel has been changing the spines. And honestly, even the... The placement of X-Men, the Fall of the Mutants, is a little, looks a little bit lower. And you have that Walter Simonson Cyclops there. Uh, the back should be the same, identical. Yes. Now, the book is exactly the same underneath the dust jacket. So, speaking of underneath the dust jacket, ta-da! Part of me kind of wishes it had the new coloring in there, but, you know, we're not going to get in that, into that. Uh, okay, here's the spine. No picture at the bottom. And then the back of the book, you get the direct market cover. So I love when they do that art on the board. Uh, let's go ahead and get this open. Talk about the stories in here. Look at this wonderful artwork. And this, by the way, if you're new to the channel, this is my favorite X-Men event. Let's go ahead and open this book up. Uh, the book has 824 pages. Now, this is so much so my favorite event. I haven't even opened the book up other than to stretch the spines a couple times. Uh, this time around, this is printed at the Donley printer. The original printing was also printed at the Donley printer, but again, you have a decade uh, in between the two printings. Uh, and you kick it off with X-Factor number 18. So this does collect X-Factor 18 through 26, New Mutants 55 through 61, Uncanny X-Men 220 to 227, 
uh, Captain America 339, X, uh, oh no, um, Daredevil 252, Fantastic Four 312, Incredible Hulk 336 and 337, as well as 340, and Power Pack 35. Um, now, let's go ahead and uh, talk about this particular event. So all of this is pretty much, if you're reading this in chronological order, this is between Mutant Massacre and Inferno Prologue. All the stories in here are separated by story arcs. We talk about events in comics like uh, War of the Realms or uh, The King in Black. Um, events that don't have a part one, part two, part three. That's what this is. This really, X-Men didn't have those kind of events until Inferno. Where it was like part the first, part the second. To read part the third, you need to go and buy X-Factor. Uh, if you want to continue the story, go and read Uncanny X-Men. That didn't happen until Inferno. We had events like the summer events that kicked it off with Mutant Massacre, and then we had Fall of the Mutants. Now, this is separated, like I said, by story arcs, so the first third of the book is nothing but X-Factor issues. For a book called X-Men Fall of the Mutants, a lot of people are like, where are the X-Men? Well, this is the original five X-Men, but it's not the original five, because during this time... One of the original five is gone. He has taken out a commission. And that is, of course, Angel. And things are about to change for Angel. Uh, he is being replaced by this Morlock named Caliban, who first appeared in the pages of Uncanny X-Men. Try to get married to Kitty Pride and all that. Uh, by the way, like I said, I've just opened this up, so I'm trying to remember things as I'm flipping through here. You get to know more a little bit about the kids here. Rusty Skids, uh, Richter, that live with X-Factor during this time. Hank is also going through changes. He is no longer the Beast Hank, the Blue Furball. He is Human Hank, and he's about to go through some metamorphosis. In well, that doesn't happen until the Inferno Prologue. Uh, so this really does set up the big fight that is coming. Apocalypse is viewing all of the X Factor characters uh, fighting his horsemen. So this is the first appearance of the horsemen that go and launch an attack in New York. Now, it's only three horsemen so far. There's the parts here with the Incredible Hulk by Peter David, uh, Todd McFarlane drawing one of the issues. Remember, that was a big, hot, sought-after issue. Uh, you have the return of Cameron Hodge, who was a childhood friend of Warren Worthington III, and he's here. Oh, I can't, that's a spoiler. Um, he comes back to the team. The team doesn't really trust him, even though he helped form the team. And then he reveals a little bit more about his plans with X-Factor that include the smiley faces guys here with guns. So you have the kids fend for themselves. You have the original team fight uh, the right. That's what they're called. Meanwhile, Apocalypse is still scheming. He has three horsemen, but he's about to introduce his fourth ho horseman, and he's going to call him Death. Now, after the big fight here with X-Factor and the right, X-Factor gets summoned to Apocalypse ship. And Apocalypse tells a little bit more about himself and this big fight he's had with humanity between mutants and humans. And he's kind of want to put an end to it. So he's asking them to join his ranks. He's asking these five mutants of Cyclops, Marvel Girl, uh, Beast, Iceman, and Caliban to join his horsemen in this big fight that's going to happen between humanity and mutants. And then he reveals his fourth horseman. Now, of course, like I said, during this time, Angel is missing from the X-Factor ranks. And Apocalypse shows them this guy right here, Death. And, you know, the X-Factor is like, well, how could you do that? How could you make a creature that's based on our good friend? So there's a big fight. I love that cover, by the way. It's one of my favorite covers. Um, so there's a big fight between the Four Horsemen and X-Factor. Now, whenever I talked about like the mapping of books, whenever there are events, I think there's a good way to do it with proper amount of tie-in issues in between the issues and then putting all the issues in the back, which to me, I like to f at least have some of the issues in between the issues and it makes sense. So I love the mapping in this. This to me is perfection. Uh, because some people, I'm sure, would like, oh, I want to read X-Factor, but then I also want to read X-Men, what was going on in X-Men that month, and then I want to read what was going on in New Mutants that month, and I always like to stress the fact that if you're reading these in collected editions, then what is the point of putting arcs together, or not putting arcs together, because if all you're doing is releasing them in X-Factor March of 87, X-Men March of 87, and then New Mutants 
March of 87. Like, what's the, the, you might as well collect uh, single issues because there is really no point in collected editions. So to me, this is a perfect example of some damn fine mapping. So we have this issue of X-Factor here, which is the big fight against the four horsemen of Apocalypse. And then you have the power pack just show up out of the blue. So as you're reading this monthly, you're like, what the hell are they doing here? And on top of that, one of there is a death that isn't shown in X-Factor, but you have to read the issues of Power Pack to find out how exactly that happened. And I'm glad they collect this immediately after the issue that they show up. Uh, so they could have put this all the way in the back, and I don't think that would have been a good reading experience because you already know what it's going to happen uh but they also collect the issues of daredevil in here this is the anderson run with john romita jr and these are all tie-ins with x factor because everything is taking place in new york city and if you're wondering where the x-men are we'll we'll get there in a second uh so yes you get daredevil in here you get captain america it's also a time when captain america steve rogers isn't captain america you have a brand new captain america so he's wearing this u.s agent outfit but it's pretty much them trying to keep the city together, fighting the Four Horsemen of Apocalypse. Like I said, there is a very important death uh, in the pages of Power Pack. And then we have the aftermath of the big fight. And I love that immediately after the big aftermath, you have the issue of the Fantastic Four. Whoever mapped this years ago, because it's the exact same mapping as it was in the oversized hardcover, just did a phenomenal job with a bunch of research. This is exactly the way that I read the issues uh, whenever I go back and reread my X-Men when I was reading them in single issues. Uh, I did them by story arcs because I didn't want to interruptions in between. All right, so after the X-Factor part, you get to the X-Men. Now, X-Men is a little bit different right now. I do love the fact that they kind of catch you up to speed with the previously. I love the house ads that are here. These always freak me out at the time. Uh, so the other important thing that is going on during the X-Men at this time, or the X-Men world, or World of Mutants rather, is the Mutant Registration Act. Long before this superhero registration act that cost us Civil War, but that's another story, we had something called the Mutant Registration Act where the government was stepping in going, no, if you're a mutant, if you have powers, you're a danger to society society you have to check yourself into the government sign up and of course a lot of them are like no that goes against my freedom and my will like what is going on so they fought against it and now the x-men are the poster child for not signing up for the registration act so the government makes their own team of mutant superheroes called the freedom force but they're kind of like the suicide squad the thunderbolts where um it's villains that are now pretending to be heroes or are heroes reformed villains so you have like mystique destiny uh the blob pyro eventually like crimson commando and super saber and stonewall join them actually they join them through here um so storms are hanging out with this uh gentleman right here this is uh, naze i'm not sure if that's how you pronounce it uh right or not but he's a shaman he's kind of like a mentor to forge but he's got his own little secrets and during this time it's also important to mention that storm doesn't have power she was depowered by forge years earlier so she's here to confront him the x-men are fighting the marauder so it's the return of arc light scrambler uh harpoon scalp hunter even though i think he goes by what is it uh Gray, oh my gosh, what is his name now? Gray Hawk, Gray Worm, nope, <sighs> Gray Wolf, I'll, I'll think of it here in a little bit. Um, in 221, though, this issue right here is the very first appearance of this guy, Mr. Sinister, who they've been talking about for a while. The Marauders have talked about him, so he's kind of appeared behind the scenes, but this is his first full appearance. And you see how much of a badass he is by just choking Sabretooth with one hand. Now, this is later Redcon talking about how why Sabretooth happens to be weaker during this era, but you can read about that. Actually, you can read about that after all these stories here. So the X-Men are found now in Dallas, Texas, instead of New York. That's why they weren't part of the big New York battle against the, Mar um, not the Marauders, the Four Horsemen. So this story, this is Carrie Gamble, I think, takes a, yeah, this is the Carrie Gamble issue. Love this artwork. Um, this story takes a supernatural turn. It's not like Mutant Massacre. Uh, and then we start seeing hints of like what's to come with Inferno. 
by throwing supernatural elements. So you get to find out a dark secret about Forge, sadly. Uh, you get to find out about what his um, mentor, Naze, is really wanting. And then there is a huge sacrifice that the X-Men have to make. And again, let's talk about the mapping because in the middle of the story, the X-Men arrive in Dallas and just in time for Ground Zero, which by the way, this doesn't say Ground Zero nor Fall of the Mutants tie-in, but I'm so glad they included this in here. Uh, if you have the Peter David Hulk omnibus, this is in there. But this is the big fight against Wolverine. The big rematch between Wolverine and Hulk. So glad that's in here. So thank you to whoever mapped this. Brilliant job. And of course, I'm thinking somebody that was like 10 years ago. Then we focus back on the X-Men. The big fight against the Freedom fight Fighters here. And this is when they start sensing something is wrong. Now, Colossus, he's been out of commission since the Mutant Massacre, and he jumps back into the fight here with the help of his sister, Magic. We'll talk a little bit about her in a second. And I realize, man, this is a... I don't know how long... I gotta cut this shorter. All right. So, big fight. Beautiful Mark Silvestri artwork. But I do have to take... I have to talk about one of my favorite moments of all time. So in the process of all of this with the X-Men in Dallas, uh, they do make new friends, new allies in two reporters. So I have to show my favorite, like top 10 favorite moments of X-Men. Uh, these two people, these two characters are based on real people that Chris Claremont uh, was friends with. One of them being Neil Conan and the cameraman uh, Manoli uh, Weatherell. Now, I didn't know that these were based on real people. They were uh, they worked at NPR radio and until I think I did my very first X-Men reading order a few years back, somebody left a comment in my video and I was like, really? That's awesome. Now, sadly, uh, the gentleman, this who's an awesome character in this, Neil Conan, uh, the real life person that he's based on, passed away last year. And man, this moment right here, Wolverine delivers a wonderful speech about why they get to be the ones that make the sacrifice. And you can see what the sacrifice is through here. Uh, but it introduces the whole concept of the Siege Perilous and sets up the Outback years. But all of that is found through here. But the moment, the one panel that makes this my favorite event, that makes everything in here just worth reading, is this moment right here where the character of Neil Conan just realizes, you know, these are true heroes. We have the separation between mutant and humans. I mean, it's told through the pages of X Factor with Apocalypse, uh, and of course, the right, Cameron Hodge. And then it's told through here. We're always reminded of the struggle between humanity and mutant kind. And, you know, after Wolverine gives this whole speech about, you know, sacrifice, um, man, Neil just says, sir, I'd like to shake your hand. Damn. Oh, that spoke to me as a kid and it still gives me goosebumps. To this day, as a 44-year-old man, I love that moment. That is such a beautiful... That, that, to me, just summarizes what Chris Claremont was trying to do. He was just, you know, telling stories that not be, with the message not really being in your face, but then sometimes he just had to sneak things. I loved it. I love that moment. Uh, you can find out exactly how the fight ends up here with the adversary, but let's now go to the New Mutants because we got to start wrapping up this, er uh, this episode. Here's the June Brigman fill-in issue, but most of this drawn by Brett Blevins, inked by Terry Austin, and now Louis Simonson, who wrote the X-Factor issues, is writing New Mutants. Pretty much in this, they meet a character named Birdbrain, and they take him to his island, uh, you know, to make sure he's around his people. Well, they find out that there's a guy that's making these uh, animal, anthropomorphic animals. He's calling himself the animator, and he's got ties to Cameron Hodge and the right. Now, sadly, something horrible happens through here. And it's also very important to note that this is also the time when the New Mutants were being uh, led by Magneto. Magneto was the headmaster of the school because Professor Xavier said, I'm out of here, man. Take care of my kids. You're on your own, Magneto. And that's pretty much what's going on. So they disobey Magneto and go to this island to help their friend. And something horrible happens here. One of them gets killed. And it's such... A, reading this, you know, when it, it, it was such an... I didn't see it coming moment. I thought it was a powerful moment. And it really showcased, you know, what, the kind of relationship that these characters had and how each of them reacted. Rain, of course, acting like, man, taking it the worst. And then, of course, you see this, 
changes between Ileana and magic and then starting to become more and more like the dark child which of course leads into the events of inferno uh but that can be found through here let's look at the extras all right the extras the covers by the way all connect whether it's new mutants x factor or x-men here is that marvel age cover that they use for the direct market cover the uh the house ad so glad that's in here the recolored uh, trade. This is the one I used to have. The trade paperback from two thousand. It was two thousand and two. Okay. Uh, the essential X factors, sort of black and white collections, and then the mutant registration card where you can register. If you're wondering where the rest of the house ads and the covers are, they're all scattered in between the issues here. Now let's talk about this binding. Eight hundred and twenty-four pages. There's what the eye looks like. It is sewn binding. Um, and let's do a quick 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 because this isn't really fair they don't make books like this anymore uh the paper quality of course a decade in between is thinner than what it used to be we still have frames around the cover the exact same frames i mean this is back when they were using on the left hand side that's the original when they were using thick glossy paper and now you know paper has gotten thinner more cost effective a lot of people justify it by saying, oh, it gives me more space on my bookshelves. Uh, but I do want to point that out. Of course, like I said, 10 years difference. Colors are a little bit darker here in the original printing. Again, printed at the exact same printer. Actually, let's do a quick little comparison here. And when I say thinner, please don't be discouraged by that. Because I think some people are like, oh, it's got thin paper. No, this is actually... <laughs> Pretty thick compared to some of the ones that I've been reading recently. This is printed at the Donnelly printer, who is known for having thicker paper. So don't don't think that this is, oh, it's see-through paper. It's Gideon Bible paper. It's it's not. It's not that bad at all. Uh, but you could tell a huge difference. Again, not really a fair comparison since this was printed a decade ago. And, yeah. Uh, but as far as, like, the colors... I mean, maybe just a tad bit darker here in the original printing. Let's look at a couple of other pages. That's about the only difference. It's just a little bit darker in the original printing than it is in the new printing. All right. I do have to showcase the way and the differences that the books lay over. The top, the original printing. The bottom, the new printing. And you can see a little bit more of a gutter curve in the new printing. Not that it's horrible, but I'm just saying there is a difference in the original printing. And keep in mind, that original printing I've also read like 20 times. <laughs> and I wish I was exaggerating. I love this story. And changing it up a little bit, you have the new printing here and the original printing here on the right. Just pages from X-Men here. Again, just a little bit darker. Everything else is the same with the color schemes. And a page from the New Mutants. So... Honestly, like I said, just darker. That's it. I, I don't know how many times I've said that. Uh, but I did want to just clarify that everything, including the extras and the way that they are collected in the back, is identical to the new version. But that, as they say, is... I kept the dust jacket on. Damn it. I should have shown what was under the dust jacket in the original printing. You know, you had this, like foil this is like almost like gold foil on leather look to it they don't make books like this they don't make omnis like this anymore uh you know they make them like this usually or they just have something uh blank here with the title but yeah this is the way we used to have them like this gold foil so it's more like a chrome orange foil stamp on it uh but now that as they say is that if you're interested in purchasing this book don't forget to check out our sponsors and that was the content, the page CheapGraphicNovels.com, your online home for graphic novels and collected editions up to 50% off cover price. They have excellent shipping and prompt and helpful service. Check out their bargain deals for up to 90% off cover price. And don't forget that CGN also takes pre-orders. That way you don't miss out on the hottest releases. And they are currently running a special promotion for you Minties. If you're a first-time customer, after receiving your order confirmation email, reply back to that email and let them know Near Mint Condition sent you their way. They will then apply a free shipping promotional credit to your next order in the US. Cheap Graphic Novels, your source for the hottest books with the kind of deep discount, quality shipping, and customer service that will keep you coming back for more. If you live in Europe and are interested in pre-ordering or purchasing Omnis, then you should definitely check out Walt's Comic 
shop in Berlin, Germany. They have the cheapest pre-order prices for Marvel and DC big books within the EU, flat shipping of 990 euro for EU countries, extremely careful and sturdy packaging, emails are answered within 24 hours, and they have a superb selection of new releases and out-of-print books on their website. Just head over to waltzcomicshop.com for more great deals and rare titles. And for a limited time, you can use the code NEARMINCONDITION, all one word, at the checkout for free shipping to all EU countries with your first order. Waltz Comic Shop, your reliable source for Omnis and premium collected editions in Europe. And that was the content, the page count, and build of this omnibus. Let me know in the comments down below if you're excited for this release, if you have the oversized hardcover and you're keeping that, uh, which cover you're going to get if you are picking up this omnibus, if you've never read it, if you've read it, what you thought of the story. All your comments, if you have any questions, leave them down below. Don't forget to check us out on Patreon and Spreadshop. Amazing ways to support the channel if you can do so. And more importantly, everyone, stay healthy and safe out there. Much love. Much love.